A very good morning to one and all. I'm Dr. Sidra Ansari and in today's session I'm going to discuss about disease of salivary gland. We're all aware that there are three pairs of main salivary glands that is the parotid, the submandibular, sublingual and minor salivary glands around thousands in number form a single layer of submucosal carpet in the oral cavity wrapping up around the lip, the labial buckle and the palatal mucosa. So before we go on to the diseases of salivary glands, let's take a look at the definition of what is a gland. A gland is an aggregate of cell or organs specialized to secrete chemicals which are necessary for the body function. They can be divided into exocrine glands that the ant endocrine glands. Exocrine glands are the salivary glands and lacrimal glands, whereas the endocrine glands are pituitary, thyroid or adrenal glands. Do you know that these glands develop by six to eight weeks of gestation, wherein parotid is the first to develop, but the last one to get capsulated. After the encapsulation of submandibular and sublingual gland, but before the capsulation of the parotid gland, lymphatic system start to develop. That's the reason why we have intraglandular lymph node present and lymphatic channels that are entrapped within the parotid gland. Now, based on the type of secretion, the glands can be divided into serous, mucus and mixed gland. Parotid gland is purely serous, whereas submandibular, sublingual, labial, buccal and lingual glands, they are mixed gland, in which submandibular gland is predominantly serous, sublingual is predominantly mucus, whereas labial and buccal glands are predominantly mucus. Palatal gland are also purely mucus gland and von Edinburgh glands are purely serous gland. Now, salivary gland secretory unit consists of acinar cells. Now, these are arranged in group around a central cavity called as, now the entire structure is termed as acinus. Now, fine duct drain each acinus. Now, these ducts are called as intercalated duct. Now, these intercalated ducts open into intralobular ducts, which eventually open into interlobular or extralobular duct. And finally, all of these drain into the main duct. Let's move on to the classification of disease of salivary gland. Depending upon the developmental, they can be classified as aplasia, absence of gland, atresia, absence of duct, or aberracy, that is ectopic gland. Salivary gland dysfunction are of two main types. Xerostomia, that is decrease in salivation, or siloria or tylism, that is increase in salivation. Enlargement of salivary gland could be inflammatory enlargement or non-inflammatory enlargement. In inflammatory enlargement, we have caused because of the viral bacteria obstructions because of the salivary calculi or silolith. Non-inflammatory enlargement are autoimmune, that is Jogren syndrome, Mikulik syndrome, nutrition deficiency or HIV associated. Salivary retention phenomena, these are mucosal and ranula. Mucosal can be either extravasation type or retention type. Let's move on to the declassification of benign tumors or malignant tumors in the salivary gland. Benign tumors could be in form of pleomorphic adenoma, Wharton's tumor, basal cell adenoma, myoepithelioma. Malignant tumors like mucoepidermoid carcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma and malignant pleomorphic adenoma. Now before we move on to these diseases and discuss them in detail, we should talk about saliva. Saliva lacks the drama of tears. It lacks the toil of sweat and the importance of the blood. But still, it is a very important part of oral cavity. Its, its importance is as equal to the importance of blood in the body when it comes to saliva in the oral cavity. 90% of the saliva is secreted mainly by the three paired major salivary glands and 10% by the minor salivary glands. Around 1000 to 1500 ml of saliva is secreted per day and its pH is around 6 to 7.5. It composed of water 99.5% and solid around 0.5%. It is also contain organic compound and inorganic compound. Organic compound are in form of salivary proteins. Salivary enzymes can be present. There could be immunoglobulin Ig, IgG is present, IgA is present in the saliva. In normal people, Glucose is not present, but in case of diabetic people, glucose is present. In organic compound like bicarbonate, sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus are present in the saliva. Now the main function of saliva is digestion. 
Lubrication, it has an excellent buffering capacity because of its alkaline pH. Mechanical cleansing agent, antimicrobial and it also maintain the integrity of the tooth. Now, let's start with salivary gland dysfunction. As I mentioned earlier, it could be siloria or tylism or excessive salivation. Now, excessive salivation can be because of an abthys ulcer that is present in your mouth or it could be because of ill-fitting denture. Now, excessive salivation can also occur because in patients who have rabies or those who have metal poisoning, in that case is also excessive salivation is seen. How do you treat it? You treat it conservatively by giving anticholinergic medications like atropine. Most of the time we use these kinds of medication when you're doing a GA procedure. When you want to decrease the salivation, have a better feel of area. Then comes xerostomia, that is decrease in salivation. Now decrease in salivation can be because of, you can say, dry mouth syndrome. It could be because of uh, medication the patient is taking, that is antihypertensive medication, antidepressant medication, antihistamine. All these medications decrease the salivary flow. It could be because of radiation that salivary flow is decreased, because of uh, dry mouth syndrome as I mentioned earlier. Now how do you treat it? By giving salivary substitute to the patient and by modifying the medication which are causing xerostomia. Now salivary substitute that are commonly available are, are carboxymethyl cellulose. It could be either in form of spray, mouthwash or tablet. Mouthwash are you have 5 ml each containing sodium carboxymethyl cellulose along with glycerin and a flavoring agent. Now this will, this will add to your salivation in the mouth and decrease the xerostomia effect. Now, before we move on to the diseases of salivary gland, we should know how to examine the salivary gland. Now, as I mentioned earlier, examination always start with complete case history. So, what all are you going to ask the patient when a patient comes with a salivary gland problem? Most of the time, these salivary gland problems are basically enlargements of salivary gland. Okay, So, there will be a swelling either in the parotid region, submandibular region or sublingual region. Okay, You will ask the patient regarding the mode of onset of swelling whether it was acute or because of some trauma or it is gradual. The duration of onset of swelling. How long was the swelling present? Was the swelling increase and decrease when the swelling is increasing when you are eating That is, and after eating that is basically because of the salivary calculi that is present. Also ask the progress of the swelling. Whether the swelling is gradual or it suddenly appear. At the same time ask the geographic distribution of the swelling. Most of the time, you can see in a particular area, children are affected with bilateral submandibular swelling and there is fever. So the, these are basically mums viral infection that is spreading through. So you need to ask these important questions. Then ask regarding whether pain is present or not. If pain is present, then definitely there is an infection as an underlining cause. Now pain is because mainly because of the unyielding nature of the dense parotidomacetric fascia. Also ask the patient regarding if there is any kind of discharge that is present. There is either extraoral discharge or intraoral discharge or discharges from the duct. This is mainly because of the abscess or infection present in the parotid gland. If there is any associated symptoms associated with it like fever, malaise, vomiting, headache and all that is present or not, dehydration, ask regarding these things. Then do a complete general examination of the patient. Check the built nutrition station, hydration status, vitals. Okay, ask the patient regarding the past medical history, history of any serious disease. Like patient is suffering for hypertension. Hypertension, what medication the patient is taking? Antihypertensive medication can cause xerostomia. So if there was any previous hospitalization, ask the patient regarding that. Previous history of the patient is tobacco related habit or alcohol or smoking because smoking also causes xerostomia. Then to an examination of the swelling. Examination, we always start with an extraoral examination. First, we'll do the inspection. Inspection, we'll see the site of the swelling, where exactly the swelling is present. Then we'll see the number of swelling, whether it is one or two or multiple. Then we'll see the size and shape of the swelling, the extent of the swelling, the overlying skin of the swelling, whether there is inflammation, reddened area, fistulous tract is present or not. Once you have done your inspection, go on to the palpation. Palpation will confirm your ex or your inspection findings. When you are palpating, check for the consistency, tenderness, whether it is present or not, fixity to the overlining skin or the underlining skin. 
most of the time if a swelling is fixed it's basically a malignant swelling or a tumor or an you can say aggressive tumor swelling okay otherwise other swellings are not fixed to the underlining structure or the overlining skin then you do an intraoral examination do a heart tissue examination see if the swelling is involving the bone or it is just a soft tissue swelling look for carious teeth if they are present soft tissue examination See, look for the soft tissue swelling consistency the overlining skin inspect them and then palpate them once you have done your clinical examination you'll come to a differential diagnosis then you try to confirm these differential diagnosis with the use of imaging techniques in salivary gland disease plain film radiograph they are used to evaluate calculi or to detect calcifications in gland but you can say you can take an occlusal radiograph to see if there is any kind of calculi in the submandibular region but a most better way of doing is by doing a silography if the patient is a 40 then a silography is a better option it is most useful modality to evaluate both the intrinsic structure of the salivary gland as well as the duct as well as the parenchyma now its basic in indications of silography is if a salivary calculi is present to see how much gland destruction has occurred because of this salivary calculi to see if there is any kind of tumor in the cell in the salivary gland if there is any kind of inflammation chronic inflammation in salivary gland which you are not able to understand what exactly it is then a silography will help in this condition now contraindication of silography is you cannot use in acute condition and in those patient who are hypersensitive to dyes like iodine then computed tomography it is an excellent anatomical it gives an excellent anatomical details of the infiltrative condition of the intrinsic as well as the extrinsic salivary gland tumors and identification of calculi you will be able to see calculi more prominently in those are not even calcified that you can see in computed tomography magnetic resonance imaging also have its advantage in salivary gland basically in case of tumors to see the extent of tumor and the invasion of tumor whether the other adjacent soft tissues are involved or not then come diagnostic ultrasound they are basically used to differentiate between a solid and a cystic lesion let's move on to the disease of salivary gland we begin with mucosal okay it is basically seen in young children and it's a painless and recurrent swelling not more than 1 cm in size depending upon the site there are of two type extravasation type more commonly seen in the lower lip the most common site of the trauma that is extravasation wherein an injury to the minor salivary gland occur they rupture and cause collection of the fluid just below the mucosa that is extravasation type then come the retention type which is occur more commonly in the floor of the mouth this is against the gravity so it's try to accumulate that's the reason why it's retention it get retained in the salivary glands minor salivary glands then these mucosal can either be superficial or deep superficial mucosal are you can say a uh, vesicle like swelling the overlying skin it is bluish in color the overlying skin is very thin it will easily rupture when you are trying to remove it whereas deeper lesion you will see a soft fluctuant swelling but the overlying mucosa is similar to the adjacent mucosa a treatment of mucosal is ex excision with strict removal of any plunging peripheral minor salivary gland but at the same time you have to keep in mind not to do any kind of injury when you're trying to close your incision area after removal of the gland because once you're trying to close and if the adjacent minor salivary glands are punctured there are high chances that a mucosal can recur again removal of the offending cause they are basically because of either the sharp tooth or an ill fitting denture you have to remove them to treat a mucosal then ranula ranula is nothing but mucosal that occur in the floor of the mouth associated with either sublingual duct or wharton duct now it has arise from the name rana which is similar and resembled to the underbelly of frog that's the reason why it is called as a ranula now clinically it's a slow growing swelling okay soft in consistency freely movable fluctuant non pitting on pressure it can cause deviation and elevation of the tongue if it is too large ranula can either be superficial and deep ranula 
Superficial ranula are, as I mentioned earlier, the overlining mucosa is thin, it is bluish in color. Whereas deeper ranula will have an extraoral swelling associated with it. It's, it's normally larger in size, have an extraoral swelling along with an intraoral swelling, but the overlining mucosa is, is normal to the adjacent mucosa. Now treatment of ranula. Excision of ranula is a must. Marsupialization, yes, you can do it in some extent, but it is basically restricted to large ranula where you want to decompress it. Okay, so once you have done the decompression, you have shrink in the size, then eventually you have to enucleate it. But keep in mind, when you have to remove a ranula, remove the sub sublingual gland along with the ranula. It is better, it will prevent the recurrence. So when you're removing the ranula, remove the sub sublingual salivary glands. Then we move on to silatinitis. It is nothing but inflammation of salivary gland, namely involving the acinoparenchymal parenchyma of the gland. Now, it could be viral infection, acute bacterial infection, or chronic, chronic bacterial infection. Now, basically, viral infection are caused by paramyxovirus. These are called as mums. These are acute conditions and are contagious in nature and affect the parotid gland bilaterally. More commonly seen in children, an incubation period is around 2 to 3 weeks before the onset of symptoms. Now, initially, there will be mild fever, headache, chills, and vomiting. This is followed by severe pain below the ear, followed by sudden onset of a firm, rubbery, elastic swelling of the salivary gland. Now, as the swelling increases, it will try to elevate the ear lobe. It enlarges bilaterally, it is tender, and the edema of the overline, there is edema of the overlining skin. It is associated with xerostomia, trismus, cervical lymphadenopathy. But the symptoms last for a few weeks and the condition is generally self-limiting. It will heal automatically. Then the, the, if you do a diagnostic workup, you will see lymphocytositis. Increase in serum amylase level after two to three weeks. And if you do a viral, or serolo, viral serology, then you will find a fourfold rise in mum's antibody titer. Now, the, though the disease is self-limiting, but if it occur in adult, it causes inflammation of gonads and central nervous system resulting in ochitis, that is testicular atrophy and sterility of approximately 20% of young men, and oophoritis in 5% of female, septic meningitis in 10%, pancreatitis in 5% and hearing loss in 5%. Most of the time there is permanent hearing loss and it is unilateral. Now, how do you treat it? It is self-limiting. So you will provide symptomatic treatment. Ask the patient to have complete bed rest, avoid going outside, hydrate the patient, increase the amount of fluid intake and give an antipyretic and analgesic. How do you avoid this condition? You have to vaccinate the child with the mumps vaccine that is MMR, measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. The first dose is given at 15 months and the second dose is given at around four to five years of age. Let's move on to bacterial infections. Now, they basically affect the major salivary gland and they're divided into acute and chronic or it could be a recurrent bacterial infection. Now, acute bacterial silatinitis can be because of the microorganism like Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus pyogenes, viridens and pneumococcus. They can also be drug-induced like antidepressant, antihistamine, antihypertensive. Why? Because these drugs cause xerostomia. And xerostomia is because there is decreased salivation, so the bacteria has a more chances to get inside the salivary gland and affect it. These are also common in debilitating patients with poor oral hygiene. Now, in case of acute bacterial silatinitis, clinically it will manifest as a swelling of the major salivary gland. Okay, initially there is pain. Pain is followed by mild swelling which try to elevate the ear and the swelling will enlarge. There is edema of the overlining skin. Now pain is excruciating. The pain is basically because of the unyielding nature of the parotidomacetric fascia. Okay, it is tenderness and if you see intraorally there will be pus discharge from the duct of the salivary glands. Now chronic bacterial silatinitis they're basically idiopathic. They can also occur because of ductal obstruction because of a calculi or a congenital stenosis or because of bacteria like Staph, Viridens, E. coli and Proteus. They are clinically seen unilateral swelling over the angle region. 
in case of recurrent sialadenitis, you will have a period of remission, cure, remission and cure. There will be aggravation of the disease, then a period of remission, then aggravation, then a period of remission. Now, your diagnostic workup. You have to do a culture and sensitivity test of the exudate in this condition. Now, why this is important? This is important because we have to establish whether these, the presence of Staphylococcus aureus or not. And if Staphylococcus aureus is present, then it is of what type? Whether it is true methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or it is because of penicillin release via elab penicillin resistant via elaborate beta lactamase. Now, why all these things are important is according to this culture sensitivity test, we can start a specific antibiotic. Normally, we will do an empirical and start an empirical antibiotic and wait for the culture 48 to 72 hours. But once you get a culture, you need to start with a culture sense because you know that these organisms are present. It's better to start those antibiotics which are effective against those particular organisms to prevent the chances of resistance towards antibiotics. And if you do a blood count, in these cases, you will see mild leukocytosis and immature neutrophils. Now, treatment of sialadenitis is, you ask the patient to take a bed rest, hydrate the patient. If the patient is very sick, then you need to hospitalize the patient. Once you hospitalize the patient, start an IV line, start with the fluid. Then you give IV ampicillin plus sulbactam 1.5 gram 6 RV or IV ciprofloxacin 400 mg 4 RV. In case the patient is better and you want to do it in outpatient basis thing, then you can start orally amoxicillin plus clavulanic. That is 625 mg twice a day or orally ciprofloxacin 500 mg twice a day. If these drugs are not effective, then you can offer second generation cephalosporine, metronidazole or clindamycin. In case of methicillin resistance to phallococcus aureus, IV 500 mg of vancomycin 12 hourly is given or on outpatient basis you will give oral vancomycin 100 mg two times a day. Now comes the parotid abscess. It's a forgotten entity in modern day practice because of the advance the medicine. Here the, nowadays the patients are so educated that they themselves will google up things and come to you. So the patients are more aware of the condition. So they approach the doctor faster so that these condition doesn't occur. Now basically parotid abscess occur because the bacteria get ingressed into the parotid gland through the duct, penetrate the gland and destruct the parenchyma. Causes the destruction of the gland and collection of the exudate and abscess formation. Now then this can also occur because of a chronic obstruction in form of a calculi. Now small foci of a uh, destruction can coalesce together to form a single large infected cavity. Now, obstructive salivary gland disorder that is sialadenitis. Now, sialadenitis of sil formation of silolith in salivary duct of the gland result in obstruction of salivary flow. So, salivary calculi is nothing but silolith. It get formed either into the duct or in the gland and obstructed flow. 90% is seen in the submandibular gland. Now this is mainly because of three important reasons. The first is because of the long curve and tortuous course of the Wharton's duct, which is against the gravity, which causes stagnation of saliva. Secondly, it has high mineral content of calcium and phosphorus. Thirdly, it has it is highly mucus secretion. That's the reason why there are more chances of salivary calculi to develop in salivary gland. Now, silolith, calcif calcified mast with laminated layers of organic material. In silolith, there will be a central nidus of either organic material, either in form of bacteria or desquamated cell, which is formed by layers of organic material outside, inorganic material outside. So basically, composite composition consists of organic and inorganic content. Organic content has bacteria and desquamated epithelial cell, whereas inorganic content, hydroxyapatite or, or you can say calcium phosphate crystals are present. Now, silolith grow at a rate of 1 mm per year. Okay. Clinically, more commonly, they are seen in middle-aged people. It is associated with pain and swelling during the during and after eating of food which because there is stimulation of saliva at this time saliva tries to flow but because of obstruction it doesn't flow so there is severe pain in that area 
Now, if stone is present at the periphery, you will be able to palpate it. Now, signs, if it gets secondarily infected, then you will see severe pain and suppuration of exudate and there will be fever associated with it. Then how will you diagnose it? Either on plain radiograph, you can take an occlusal view or a lateral oblique view to identify it. Or you could do a silography. Now, silography is, you will see as a radiolucent area on a silo, silograph. So those stones which you cannot see on plain film, you could see on silograph. CT scan can also be used to identify salivary gland calculi. Even those calculi which are not calcified can be seen on CT scan. Ultrasound can be used but only when the calculi are more than 2 millimeters. Now, silography. It was first performed by Carpi in 1902. Now, this technique is employed to exam is employed for examination of both parenchyma and ductal abnormality. Like in silography, you can see the duct as well as the parenchyma of the gland. Now, in this case, you will inject a radio opaque dye through the ductal system and you will be and take a radiograph and see the pattern. It is basically indicated in salivary calculi. In chronic, a recurrent non-specific enlargement of salivary gland, salivary gland inflammation, you can see. Non-inflammatory enlargement of salivary glands, you can see. Now, contraindications, as I mentioned earlier, is contraindicated in those patients who are hyper hypersensitive to iodine or radio-opaque dye and in case of acute infection. Now, in silography, there are three phases. You have the ductal phase, the acinar phase and evacuation phase. Now the ductal phase starts once you inject the solution till you can see radio opaque dye completely filling the duct. The acinar phase starts when the duct get emptied, it becomes radio opaque and the, and the radio opaque dye enter into the acinar system. Now evacuation phase is that phase it helps to see the ex, expulsion of the saliva, excretion, basically the excretory function of the gland will help you in this evacuation phase will help you to assist the excretion of the gland. In normally silograph, it will appear as a leafless tree appearance as you can see in the radiograph. Now, there are different radiographic findings that you can see in silography. If there is salivary calculi or a stricture that is trying to obstruct the duct, you will see a radiolucent lesion in that area. Okay, if there is presence of tumor like adenoma of major gland, there will be displacement of the gland away uh, and curving of the collecting duct. So you have a hand holding a ball appearance. Whereas in case of Jogren syndrome, there will be large dye filled cavity. So you have a cherry blossom or branchless fruit laden tree appearance. Now this slide is shown how do you manage a salivary calculi. The first figure is you can see bilateral submandibular salivary calculi are present. You will put a stay stitch on the duct posterior to the calculi and a stay stitch anterior to the calculi so that it doesn't slip anteriorly and posteriorly. Once you have put the stay stitch, make an incision on the crest that is on the calculi, then do a dissection, remove the calculi and suture it back again. Similarly that it is done on the other area and suture back it again. Now, we come to non-inflammatory enlargement of salivary gland, one of which is Jogren syndrome. It is, an auto, it is an immunological disorder. It is basically a triad of dry eyes, xerostomia and rheumatoid arthritis. Here, the lymphocyte-mediated destruction of exocrine glands takes place, leading to xerostomia and keratoconjunctivitis sicca. 90% of the cases are seen in women and around the age of 40 years. Now it has two forms, primary and secondary. Primary basically affect the cell, uh, excretory glands, exocrine glands, whereas, whereas secondary, they, they, cause, they are also present with autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus erythematosus. Clinically, there will be bilateral parotid gland enlargement. There will be dry eye, dry mouth. There is hyperfunction of both the lacrimal as well as the salivary gland. Now, the laboratory finding, you will see multiple organ or tissue specific antibodies are found. That is anti-salivary antibody and, rheumat and rheumatoid factors. If you do a shimmer test, shimmer test is nothing but you have to put two strips of litmus paper in the inferior phonics and keep it for five minutes and see how much the litmus paper is wetted. 
If it is less than 5 mm or equal to 5 mm, then, then the shimmer test is positive because a normal individual can wet the litmus paper to around 15 mm when it is kept for 5 minutes. The other laboratory finding that you can do is a rose bengal dye test. It is used to detect damage and denuded area of the cornea. Then you also have to test the salivary flow rate. Less than 6 ml per 6 minutes has, was considered to be abnormally low. Now, if you do a silo chemistry, you will see an elevated level of IgA and sodium and potassium. Silography, you will see a cavitative defect which will fill with radio-opaque contrast medium that is termed as branchless fruit-laden tree appearance or cherry blossom appearance. Now, how do you treat Jogren syndrome? You tell the patient to avoid alcohol, tobacco because these are all the things that will accentuate xerostomia. Then put them on silo gauge or salivary substitute. Use a sugar-free chewing gum, then salivary substitutes or spring. Then you have topical fluoride to prevent caries because the salivary flow is decreased. So basically these are symptomatic treatments that you can provide for this. There is no cure as such but you are giving just a palliative treatment. Let's move on to parotid fistula. It is nothing but a communication between the skin and the parotid gland or duct. Now fistula can be because of a post-surgery, whether you're doing a parotid gland surgery after the surgery a fistula can develop. Then it could be because of rupture of the parotid gland, injury to the parotid gland or inadvertent incision of the parotid abscess. You have given multiple incision, not sutured it properly or there is gunshot wound or trauma. Now clinically they will manifest as a scar or a cutaneous fistula. There will be continuous clear fluid discharge. This discharge will definitely increase with the drink or food intake. There is progressive skin necrosis. Now skin necrosis is because of the enzymatic lytic action of saliva which occur on the skin. Now conservative management for this is aspiration and pressure dressing. You could give anticholinergic agent or Botox type A injection. Now both of this it causes decrease in salivation which will help the healing phase. Now as the salivation decreases, your healing will increase in that area. The cutaneous tissue will heal properly. Or you could give a radiation therapy of 1800 rods for 6 weeks. Now this radiation therapy, leave it for a last resort. In case when you have tried to close the fistula but it has not closed completely, as a last resort you could offer a radiation therapy because it basically causes fibrosis of salivary gland. So we reserve this thing for the last treatment. Then the surgical mortality that you can do is surgical excision of the fistula tract followed by high pressure dressing on the wound. Or you could ligate the duct from both the end inside the gland as well as from the orifice. Or repair the duct over a stent. Or if that is also not possible, you could do a ductoplasty. That is nothing but fistulization of the duct into the oral cavity. Rather than the fistula coming out from the, uh, you can say the skin, you can shift it towards the oral cavity. Just to summarize this, okay, if there is any kind of a lump in your parotid region, Okay, if it is acute and bilateral, it is mums. If it is unilateral and if it is very painful and it is uh, swelling is very poor oral hygiene, fluid dehydration and very ill patient, it is acute parotitis or parotid abscess. If the swelling increase in size on eating or drinking or pressure, it is foul smelling, purulent discharge, it is basically because of a parotid calcula or silolithiasis. If the swelling is chronic, and if it is slow growing, post-surgical it is there, then it is silocele. Silocele is nothing but collection of saliva beneath the skin. Or if it is a bilateral swelling, non-inflammatory, painless enlargement of the gland associated with dry mouth, dry eye or rheumatoid arthritis, then it is Jogren syndrome. Similarly, if there is a lump that is present in submandibular gland, it could be that the submandibular lymph node is enlarged. Now if you know it is not the lymph node, it is gland, then try to divide. If the swelling is acute, then it could be mums. If the swelling is chronic and if it is bilateral, non-inflammatory painless enlargement, then it is Jogren syndrome. And if it is unilateral swelling which increase in size on eating and pressure, foul smelling discharge, then it is because of a submandibular calculi. Just a flow chart to sum up all the different type of diseases that can occur in salivary glands. With this, I would like to conclude. Thank you.